Thanks, Sarah. Um, thanks very much to everybody for turning out today. Um, I'm really looking forward to this session. We've been doing a lot of talking, I think, about digital innovation and the some of the investments that are happening in the region. Um, and one of the, one of the reasons that we were so keen to support uh, and run this session today is that in April we ran an event with the. University of Dundee's Business School, where we were looking at what did recovery and, and the next phase of our economy look like. And what we did was we had four discussion groups where we went off and talked about some of the key things that are kind of top of everybody's mind or or might or could be top of everybody's mind at the moment as we, we kind of work out what does the rest of this year and next year look like for us as businesses and for the local economy. And Net zero clearly is something that everybody is talking about or green growth or, um, you know, carbon neutrality or climate change. And uh, it was a really interesting look from a business perspective at that. And, and unsurprisingly, I think many um, SMEs that were in that discussion were saying, we're not really sure what that means for us. We kind of get how the governments talk about it. We get you know, what we might personally do um, and, and recycle at home, etc. But how can my business take advantage of net zero as an opportunity? So that's one theme that we're definitely going to be carrying on and, and doing more work in. And we also talked about the future of our workplaces. So, you know, as we come out of restrictions and, and the pandemic, some businesses have obviously been operating from their the business premises and, you know, and, and just carrying on mostly um, uh, but with socially distanced rules in place. But others that have primarily office space or, or you're used to doing a lot of business travel may just be thinking, well, what does the future look like? And I think we're all um, probably looking at some kind of hybrid working. Um, and so that was, that was a really interesting look at what do our spaces need to do for us um, in the future? And how can we make sure that we deliver the right spaces for our customers, for our team, and, and just, you know, um, but also from a from a local economic perspective, you know, the lack of people moving about the city centre is doing nothing for the coffee shops and the hotels and the restaurants and um, the independent retailers and, and whatnot. So, so yeah, it was a, that was a, an interesting look. We then also talked about future skills because how many of us um, thought that we would need to become experts in running webinars in in kind of you know doing one to ones and and coaching people um, on a on a virtual um, room and, and it's just, you know, how do we adapt? How do we think about new um, roles within our teams? So it's not just about our new starts, but it's about helping everybody think about their new skills as they as we go into the future. And are, are our businesses ready for that? Um, are we all properly equipped as leaders to think about making sure that we're equipping our people or designing roles that our people want um, in the future? And then um, we then talked about digital innovation and actually digital innovation was the most um, interesting session or it was the one that everybody was really keen to attend. We had a bigger attendance in that one than we did in the others. And again, it means so many different things to so many people. I've been in so many discussions this year where digital innovation for some people means SEO and getting more people to their website. And for others, it means a new website or a new app. Um, for other people, it's much more strategic than that. And they're already recognising that um, it could be about productivity and about making jobs better for people so that we're not having to do um, some things manually that could be handled um, electronically, then freeing up our people to do more of the good stuff and, and less of the I guess the tedious things, um, if you'd like to call it that, depends on depends on your perspective on it. I think, and um, so so yeah, so it's been a really interesting um, look. And and when we had our AGM in May, we took a paper or a presentation on the results of that to the AGM, and it very much is helping us as a chamber think about um, well, what do we do in the next eighteen months? And we are going to look at each of those key themes and really explore them in, in much greater detail. So, so that's the kind of thing that we've been doing, but we've also been seeing people in real life. And um, unfortunately, um, I had a holiday two weeks ago and did so much socialising, although it was safe, um, I was in a restaurant that closed its doors because 26 of their staff tested positive. 
and that really freaked me out. Um, so not I was doing my own lateral flow tests at home. That was negative. That was okay. But as soon as that restaurant closed its doors, I suddenly went, oh, heck, I shouldn't be doing anything. And I was so selfish to go off and do that. Why did I spend all my time um, propping up the local economy, if you put it like that? Um, so uh, on the day that I had to spend waiting for my PCR test to come through last Thursday, Sarah um, was very lucky enough to see a whole bunch of our members and we did some networking. So um, just quite general, informal, rocked up at the Malmaison um, and then people went off in their groups and just had a bit of a wander around um, Dundee's waterfront. And the feedback we've had from that has been really good. Some people were a wee bit anxious about it and um, some people were just desperate to get out and, and see other people. And we've we've had really good feedback. So our next session is going to be an Angus networking session. And we very much are hoping that we're going to be taken to the grounds of Glans Castle um, and just getting a bit of a um, chance to get out and about and very safely um, see some other people um, and just do some of the, the things that we're just used to doing, seeing other people and building relationships and catching up and seeing what people have been up to. So I guess that's really what the Chamber has been doing. Um, and we've got some great events coming up that I'll talk about um, towards the end. But I'm going to get out of the way now and introduce our first speaker and our sponsor. So um, Alan, um, poor Alan and I met in the pandemic and we've talked uh, virtually a couple of times, but it's super interesting. And when he talks about the investment that City Fibre are doing in the city, and not just the city, but I know it's now kind of um, leading its way out of um, Dundee's actual boundaries itself, um, that you'll be really keen to hear about that. And I, I think what it shows is that the city and the region is really putting digital first um, and making sure that those investments are there so that when we're ready as businesses to implement a, a really interesting and um, forward thinking strategy then we've got all the, the things that we need to make us do that. So um, Alan over to you and um, if you want to, to come in as soon as I can hear you and we can see your slides I will mute and get out of the way. Great, Alison, hopefully you can hear me and I can hear you fine. Share my screen. That's it. Perfect. Thanks, Alan. Great. Um, I can still see faces down the right hand side. Is that is that can everyone else see that as well? I'm just wondering if that's going to block. So no, it's OK. Um, well, certainly all I can see is um, about three quarters of the screen is your presentation and then I can see you pinned in the in the kind of the, the view. Okay. So I'm fine. sure it'll be fine. I'm sure it'll be fine. Okay, well, thank you um, very much. And uh, yeah, good morning to you all. So, um, yeah, I'm going to uh, give you a brief introduction to, to City Fibre. Hopefully some of you um, are aware of City Fibre um, by now. We're quite um, quite visible throughout the city as we, as we roll out our, our network on a, on a street to street basis. Um, I'll give you a bit of background to our company. Um, I'll talk about the Gigabit City uh, Dundee project, which we're now uh, well underway with. Um, before talking about what, what that actually means for, for local businesses um, and, the, and the wider economy. Um, and I'll also um, explore what types of innovations we, we can expect to see with uh, a truly world-class uh, digital infrastructure um, throughout the city. And I'll just check, since it's the first slide, has that moved on okay? Yep. Oh, yeah. Great. Um, okay, so yeah, I mean, at, at City Fibre, we're well and truly on a, a mission to uh, transform the digital capabilities of the UK. We, um, over the next five years, we're investing um, four billion pounds uh, to bring our full fibre network within reach of up to 8 million homes uh, throughout the UK. Um, and to be honest, I dare say that that, that target will, will stretch even further before, before too long. Um, and as it says here, you know, we're, we're you know, looking to, to really spark innovation and under, underpin the economy um, throughout the UK um, through this, this digital age that we're, that we're living. So never, never more, uh, more important time for everyone to have access to improved, reliable uh, and future-proof uh, digital connectivity. Really, really pleased to be playing our, our part in that. Um, so what, what actually is, um, and this, this is something that I always, always cover off at the start because it, it, it is still um, misunderstood by, I would say, the large majority of, of the people um, throughout the UK. 
Um, we've all been sold fibre broadband for, for many, many years now, um, but a lot of people don't realise or don't realise the importance of understanding that they don't actually have fibre going into their, into their home and often not into their, their business premises as well. So when you hear fibre broadband, the large majority of the time, um, that That refers to uh, fibre to the cabinet, so for the, into the properties, whether it's a business or a home, um, typically it's a, it's a copper um, cable, so it's the old, the old phone line which was never really designed for, for the internet. Um, so that's what causes a lot of the, the, the problems, the frustrations that people have with reliability um, and quality of, of connection. So with a, a true full fibre network like we're rolling out, as you can see at the, the bottom of the slide here, it is end-to-end -end fibre optics. So we're putting new new exchanges um, into these cities, rolling out completely new infrastructure, including street cabinets. And importantly, the fibre will run directly um, um, into the property, right to the router. Um, and the difference is, is it's night and day. Um, so to use a to use an analogy, um, you know, fibre to the cabinet is a bit like, um, or sorry. Yeah, fibre to the premises um, is like getting a, a lift home from your, your mate in their brand new Ferrari straight to your doorstep, whereas fibre to the cabinet is getting a, a lift home from your mate in a brand new Ferrari, but they stop at the end of your street and then the two of you have to get out and they just get a coley back to your, your front door. So it's, uh, it's a vast difference, but it's not, just about the, it's not just about the speed. As I say, it's about the quality and reliability as well. Um, and another key thing about full fibre is that it's um, symmetrical speeds. So we talk about um, gigabit, you know, capability. So that that means uh, a gigabit is a thousand megabits per second, which is many many dozens of times faster than, than the UK uh, the UK average. Um, um, so you'll get up to gigabit speeds, but that's download as well as um, upload. So typically with fiber to the cabinet, the upload speed is significantly lower than the download speed, but you will get symmetrical speeds with full fiber. So if you have a many hundred megabits per second package, for example. That is the speed that you will get for upload as well as download. So that, that's really important for, for video calls, for uploading you know, lots of files and documents to the cloud like we're all doing uh, now more so than ever. Alan, can I jump in and put you totally off your stride? Sorry. Um, it's just that your sound is dipping out and in and out a little bit. I wonder if you, do you think maybe if you put your video off while you're showing your slides, it just might be, um, I'd rather if you don't mind, because it's just would be better that we hear you, because it's... Absolutely, yeah, no problem, bear with me. Cool, Bob. thank you. That's a bit better. Um, so yeah, there, there's a, a real need for, for investment in our, our digital infrastructure. You know, it's fair to say that a number of years back, our, our nation's um, digital infrastructure was the, um, the equivalent of, of this, really. So, um, Of the skip on two slides there. There we go. Um, so yeah, and uh, as we all know, you know the our, our requirements have just just exploded. You know the, the the it's been an exponential increase in terms of the, the speed of our computers, as you can see here, the storage capacity that we need, the amount of internet traffic, but then the the broadband speed on average across the UK was was just suffering a bit. You know it was really slow to to try and sort of keep up with the, the direction that we were that we were heading. Um, and the UK, um, as you can see from, from this graph back in 2015, was way, way behind so many other nations in terms of uh, full fibre coverage. Um, so this was really hurting us. This was impacting our economy uh, and so much more. Um, so back then, back in 2015, there was only about three or four percent of properties had access to uh, full fibre. We're now up to about 20%, so we are we are starting to close the gap, which is great, but um, obviously still still some distance to go. Um, I mean, as you can see from some of the other countries on the on the graph here, the likes of Japan and Spain and Portugal are up already at 70, 80 um, plus percent in terms of their full fiber coverage. So it's really important for for, for businesses and, and our economy as a whole throughout the UK that we continue to close that gap. And this, I won't, uh, won't dwell on this one, but it's just to give you a, a, an idea of the, the scale of our work. So, as I say, it's a, a major, uh, major investment over the next five years um, and beyond. 
Um, Dundee's in a good position. You know, it's, it's already a, a relatively well-connected um, city. This, this uh, project um, will put Dundee right up there as one of the, the best digitally, digitally connected cities, not just in the UK, but in the world. So it's, uh, it's really, really exciting. Um, we will have rolled out this network um, over the next few years to the large majority of, of homes and, and businesses throughout the city. And when we do it, um, so when we roll out the full fibre network, it really is on a, a street by street basis. We, we try to reach as much of the, of the city or the town um, that we're rolling out in as, as we can. So we're not just going to a, a new housing development over on the west of the city or a, a business park in the north of the city. We want to bring it within reach of, of homes and businesses and mobile sites um, and hopefully in the public sector sites as well. Um, we build it once, we work hand in hand with, uh, with the, the council's support and um, the city council have yeah, been a great help uh, to date to continue to support us with this rollout, which is really important for the success of the, of the project. Um, and uh, it's a fairly swift build process, um, you know, although there's a, it does come with a little bit of disruption on a, a street by street basis. We, we do a lot of uh, comms, a lot of engagement with the, with the communities and, and businesses and so on, just so that people understand that it's a, a little bit of a short-term pain for, for much uh, gain over, over many years. So once we build this, once we roll it out, it's not as if we're going to have to come back in five years' time and, and put more into the ground. Um, it really is future-proof. So we, we expect that the work that we're doing now will benefit us for, for decades. So, so many, many um, you know, generations of people will benefit from, from what we're looking at, which is really exciting. And this is what it means before I get into sort of talking a little bit more about, about businesses. So we're, we're bringing this to people's doorsteps as well. And um, obviously that, that relates to business because the majority of us are, are still working from home at the, mo at the moment. So, you know, improved connectivity, you know, it's not just about um, people being able to to stream Netflix a little bit, a little bit easier, you know, without without buffering. But that's obviously something that a lot of people can, can relate to. Um, but yeah, just imagine, you know, but buffering being completely a thing of the past. It doesn't matter how many people within your home um, are, are on devices. It doesn't matter what time of day it is. Um, there, there simply will be no more no more buffering. It's, it's something that will become a, a distant memory before before too long. Um, and it also means, you know, better, better home treatment, better, better telemed use of telemedicine. Um, again, we've all got used to, to having sort of appointments with our GPs and so on. Um, and again, for, for some people now, it means that, um, that their internet speed will no longer be something that holds them back from utilising smart home technologies um, and, uh, you know, better and improved home, home entertainment uh, as well. Um, and this is this is some of the important stuff here. That this really just gives a, an overview of the of the economic impact and some of the other benefits that we can expect to see. So the, the Dundee project is um, at least a, a forty million pound private investment from City Fibre, um, and you can see here how we expect that to, to benefit the local economy over the next uh, fifteen years. This was a, an independent organisation who um, undertook a review of the impact of uh, full fibre infrastructure. Um, this was actually a few years ago this, this report was done, we're getting a, a, an updated version done at the moment because obviously the, the impact of COVID will mean that um, a lot of these figures actually will, will, be, um, will be increased. So to pick out a few examples from here, so you know, £27 million by household benefits. So but part of that figure is made up from the fact that um, a full fibre connection into a property on average um, increases that home's value by around about 3% because it is in such um, high demand at the moment and so important for people to have um, excellent connectivity. Um, increased worker flexibility, um, business productivity as well, businesses being more productive and more efficient with having quality connectivity, whether that's people working from home or when, when we get back into, into the offices. Um, business startups as well, again, we expect that um, you know, a full fibre network throughout a city will will um, generate further business startups, it will generate further investment um, into, into the city as well. Um, and, uh, and 5G innovation, so again, quite often I get asked about 5G and, you know, I have been asked the question, why, why, why are you spending all this money rolling out a full fibre network when 5G is, is the next big thing um, and everyone will be using 5G before we know it? But actually, you need, you need that backbone full fibre infrastructure to enable 5G and, and other similar um, technologies. 
So yeah, I, I won't go through all of these. Um, I'm delighted to, to share these slides, and uh, if anyone uh, if anyone would like to follow up and connect afterwards, I'd be delighted to, to share further information on this or the, the full report if anyone's interested to, to see it. And obviously, we're already seeing um, huge changes in our workplaces, and I, I, I do believe it won't be too long before we're, we're back into the workplaces, and I certainly hope that that, that will be the case, because I miss it, I miss it a lot. Um, but we are already seeing huge evolution of our workplaces and use of technology within, within work, uh, whether that's um, for, for training or otherwise. So, yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, virtual reality or entity reality for um, training and, and competency within, within the workplace is, is, one, is one great example. Um, we've got recycling plants that are already utilising artificial in intelligence um, to, to sort through the, the, the recycling on the, on the conveyor belt. Obviously, data as well um, can be used and is being used to shape how our workplaces will, will look in the future. I used to work for a, um, a workplace design specialist, actually, and they would send people out um, for two or three weeks at a time to sit within an office and just take notes um, and see how many people are using their desks and just see how the workspace is used, who's using the, the different uh, meeting rooms at different times. And they would use that to help to shape the, 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 the workplaces for those companies. Now, with, with the use of data and sensors throughout offices now, there's no need for somebody to go and sit in that office for two or three weeks at a time. We can collect that type of data if the business wants, uh, wants that to happen. And that can really help them to shape the workplace and make sure that they've got the most efficient uh, working environment that they, can, that they can possibly have for, for their specific requirements. So just, uh, just a few examples there, obviously many, many more. Um, and what it means for the for the, the, the wider city and, and, and obviously, you know, in terms of innovation. Um, again, this backbone infrastructure will enable so much um, for, for Dundee in, in the years ahead. Um, so um, smart city um, technologies, for example. So um, it could be utilised for um, improving traffic flows uh, through a city. So again, it might be sensor networks that we have through the city that tie back into to a full fibre network. Um, Drones, delivery robots, it might sound very futuristic, but I genuinely don't believe we're, we're too far away from, from seeing that type of thing. There are some trials um, underway already um, at a couple of different places throughout the UK, um, from supermarkets, you know, doing deliveries to, to people's doorsteps, um, to um, prescriptions being taken to people's homes, um, you know, within, within half an hour or even quicker. So um, it might, that type of technology might you know, might scare some people, but um, I think it's I think it's quite exciting to know that if it's done right and if it's done if it's done um, properly, then that, that could be what we see um, in the not so distant future. Um, so again, smart HD, you know, CCTV, so um, smart city technologies, which could really help to improve the, the safety um, of our streets and, and even improve the, the quality of the air that we're breathing. So a whole host of possibilities uh, with again with this type of technology. And I think for me, really the exciting thing is that for, for businesses, there's no there's, there's really no way of knowing just how this technology will be used and how it will continue to evolve. We've seen how much things have changed over the past year, never mind the past 10 years. So um, yeah, really exciting to think just how, how this might be utilized um, in 10, 15, 20 years time once, once our children are, are growing up um, um, and they have kids of their own. So that, that's um, that's everything for me. So um, we are um, we're, we're rolling this out throughout the, the city. Um, you can go onto the the, the, the website cityfiber.com if you want to find out a little bit more. Um, also, there's a postcode checker on there. So for, for anyone that wants to go on and find out when they can when they can get connected. Um, but yeah, please do connect with me on, on LinkedIn. Delighted to follow up with anyone if you if you'd like to have a coffee and a chat about what you do and uh, a little bit more about City Fibre's work in the city. So um, I'll hand back over to Alison. Thanks very much um, for the opportunity this morning and uh, I look forward to Q&A. Brilliant. Thank you, Alan. Um, if you would stop sharing your screen and what we'll do next is hand over to Martin. So I'm really looking forward to um, hearing Martin telling us a little bit about the work that Bantech does. Um, I was very lucky to sit in on a session um, that he came and spoke to the Dundee Partnership about the work that Bantech have done in the city for a long time. And when we were looking for someone that in, in today's session that could help us 
as businesses work out what to do with all of this investment and how to to think about creating strategies or or you know embedding technologies into what we do as businesses then um you know i knew that we could go and ask martin and i was very hopeful that martin would be able to come and speak so martin um over to you thank you Alison. um thanks everyone great to be here um do i need to put myself in the spotlight or am i doing this right now anyway i'll just keep talking um Thank you. Uh, it's good to be back in the office. Um, it's nice to see um, I've got a presentation which I'll share, um, but I'm just going to talk today because um, technology innovation seems to be a really wide remit. Um, another thing as well, as Sarah picked up before, the, the monitor I'm looking at is to my right. So if I'm not looking at the camera, I apologise. It's because we're, we've got a cyber summit happening on Friday in Sanders and my TV is heading off that way. So um, technology innovation, such a wide remit. Um, didn't actually know the best way to approach this. So I thought the best thing to do is kind of talk about what we do and, and try and understand um, what our understanding of, uh, of technology innovation is. Because I mean, there've been lots of companies and the, the first thing that I did when I was in my twenties, I, I did a board game and then a TV game show, which went on American Network with Disney and Universal. And that absolutely was not innovation in any way, shape or form. Um, and I thought that um, we develop products and platforms for, for customers. Um, and I didn't think that was innovative from our point of view, but we do some products for, with a much wider remit that I thought was innovative. But I was talking with uh, some of the team yesterday and actually the stuff that we do for our clients is probably the most innovative thing that we do because they come with an issue and a problem. And I think that's what innovation should do. It, it's there, uh, you find a need, you identify an opportunity and you fill it. And that could be something that you know, a, a client or a company has you know, as part of their manufacturing process, as part of the sales process, that there's, there's an issue and you build something that, that stops uh, or fulfills that need and the requirement for it. So I think uh, from a point of view, I think from a, a platform building point of view, we aren't innovative, but our clients come with an innovative need and then we help them fulfill that. But from a wider remit, we are, we're building products that are innovative. So I'll do some of the product stuff first. Um, we're, um, we're working in a range of, of tech sectors. Um, the first thing we're doing is travel tech. So we've got a uh, disruptive platform that's for a, a travel industry that we've built, that we own. Uh, we're heavily involved in med tech just now as well. So um, it launched about two weeks ago. We've got uh, um, an app and a management system for people on the journey with dementia. Um, I, I haven't been touched with dementia in my family, but um, we, we have a partner that, that came to us with um, this, this project. And so we, we launched um, um, Peggy, which is a, a dementia app, which connects, you use a thing called reminiscence therapy, and it's to, to help people and the, the families connect with, with people suffering dementia um, and helps basically you know, fire the neutrons of the brain and get thing, things working and, and store that information. So uh, we're heavily involved as well in FinTech as well. We developed uh, an FX trading platform that analyzes seven years of historical data, um, which allows people to make decisions when to, to buy and sell foreign currencies. We, uh, at the start of the pan pandemic, there was a, a company that came to us looking for um, a platform to allow um, people to compete against uh, the just seats and the deliveries of the world um, to, to take that cost base away. So we developed a, a delivery platform that it's uh, it's a monthly fee rather than a commission-based process. So we identify an opportunity and we build something that fits that around it. But the core of what we do is, um, is, we, is we build systems to allow companies to function um, more efficiently. So we look at um, quicker, simpler, less labor dependent, allowing them to free up resources and move forward uh, and help um, help them function and help them grow. So we innovation comes to us rather than us coming with the idea of innovation from that point of view. We, uh, we're, we're now being forced to innovate in a different way though. Um, so as much as I don't think we innovate from much from the platform point of view, I think that, that cyber um, and cyber security is forcing us to have to innovate. Um, we've got, and people are welcome to, to join us online if you want to. We've got uh, major corporates joining us in St Andrews on Friday um, to discuss the problems that, that cyber security has. We've got uh, Wipro Barclays, um, uh, we've got Color Tokens, uh, Unisys, 
So there's a major, major global, a global corporates coming to, to talk about what's going to happen. And what we've been forced to do from an innovation point of view is to look at security of the stuff that we build. Software is inherently insecure. Doesn't matter what people tell you about the stuff that we've built historically, it isn't secure. You know, we, we, we build stuff, we do the, um, you know, the best endeavors, the best efforts that we can. But the reality of it is, um, apart from SSL security, it, it's, not, it's not a secure environment. So what we're doing now is the stuff that we're now building um, has security built into it inherently from its base. And that's what the future holds for us. So from an innovation point of view, it's security for us and it should be for everybody because the world's changing. Um, and, you know, the pandemic has, has forced everybody to, to work online, to work remotely. And security has to be the, the core of what we're doing now. So from an innovation point of view, I think we are innovative to a point, but we're driven to be innovative by what our clients tell us to do. And I, I think most of today was about hopefully getting some, some questions fired up and I can answer those back. But um, the core of what we do is, is, is satisfy other people's needs. So I hope that makes sense. Brilliant. It sure does, Martin. Thank you so much. That's great. Um, and I think that's, that's the important thing, isn't it? You know, often as a business, you've got an idea, but you don't have a clue how to do it. Um, and that's not our job, is it? <laughs> um, and it's, I guess it's, it's specialists like yourself that will say, actually, you know, you've, that idea you've got, we'd be so much better if you did it in that direction or, um, you know, here's how we can actually get you to where you need to go. So thank you. Um, I, just, just to, I think... Um, Innovation is actually very process driven. So um, even when, when, when clients speak to us about it, there, there's a process where it's, it's very analytical. You work at what the requirements are. We spend a lot of time working at if that's needed and will it enhance the business. Um, technology from um, a point of view, something when we, I mean, oh God, 20, it's my birthday today. I'm really old, um, but um, we started doing this, we found this company, or I bought into my first tech company that came back to the States in 1999. Um, Technology has evolved so much back, back then. Um, the process of, of building software was years and hundreds of thousands of pounds. That's not the case anymore. You know, modern technologies, cloud-based technologies allow you to do something rapidly. It's technology that allow rapid application development environments. So from you know, we, we built our first platform for a major travel company back in, and then a supermarket chain uh, in 2000. And the development timetable was about 18 months and it was several hundred, and our partner at that time was BT. Now, um, a development environment timescale, four, eight, 12 weeks. You scope it out at the start of it, the development, the cost, and it's, it's technology has allowed this to happen. Um, and, you know, the, the the kids, I mean, we're, we're 28 people now uh, in the software company um, and we're, you know, they're, they're getting younger and young. I, I had a conversation yesterday with, with, uh, with Ben, who's one of our youngest developers, born this century, which is a concern anyway. And um, we had a conversation about cassette tapes, which he thought was stupid. And you know what they are. Um, but, but that's how, you know, innovation has happened, you know, cassette, and then we ended up with CDs, DVDs and things moving on. And I think it's an iterative process that we're going through just now. It doesn't have to be bleeding edge. It can be how you, how you change, how you work internally. You know, I, I, they sign me up to TikTok. I don't get it. Um, but you know what? Uber, Uber is innovative. TikTok, I don't get, get that, but Uber's changing lives and it is, a, it is an innovative process going forward. So we're um, a little bit blunt in, in how we deal with stuff, but we'll, um, you know, we, we're, we help companies change the way that they function. Love it. And of course, cassette tapes are useless without an HB pencil, aren't they? But then th those young people in your office have no idea what the two things have even got in common. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think that, that's really interesting. I'm not on TikTok because I'm not even sure I get it at all. Um, however, um, uh, happy birthday. There's a whole bunch of people wishing you happy birthday in the chat, Martin. <laughs> Um, thank you for coming and doing this on your birthday. We do appreciate it. Um, so next, we're going to hear from Marcus Wiley. And, and again, you know, when Sarah and I were talking about how do we get a company that can come and talk through how they're kind of innovating and what they've done from a technology point of view. And um, we knew that, you know, Insights had done 
a lot and, and probably there's been a whole lot more that we don't know about and um, that's happening in the background so I'm really looking forward to to hearing from Marcus and just hearing about some of the work that Insights have done and um, so Marcus over to you. Great stuff Alison and we'll have to get you signed up to TikTok and uh, get you doing some of these crazy dances you know oh, no. you probably know more about TikTok than you you uh, you are aware um, so I'll try and keep my focus but I can't uh, can't stop watching that little dancing salamander behind Georgia there. It's just like dancing away, isn't it? Having, having fun when the, the cams are up. Um, so hi, I uh, hope you're all doing well this morning. I'm Marcus Wiley, work at Insights. So a little bit about that company in, in a minute. I describe myself as a, a liberator, an initiator, and an entertainer. Um, I've been at Insights for, for over 20 years, so probably longer than that chap that was born this century. Uh, uh, Martin, um, or even I think Billy Gilmore was probably born this century and he's doing all right for himself, you know, uh, poor, poor lad that he is and uh, hopefully the rest of the guys will do well tonight. So um, uh, in, in Insights, my role is Head of Learning and Experience, which is a customer facing role because we provide uh, learning to the world and um, experiences. So what we do is we, we our product is self-awareness, right? That's what we sell to people. We sell that to uh, teams, leaders, organisations. And, um, and we're really looking to help organisations just be at their very best from a people development perspective. And we partner with some pretty cool organisations around Scotland, the UK and around the globe, um, actually. So that's a little bit about what we do. So this story is how... Um, ...journey, and it goes hand in hand with the, with the pandemic because uh, the pandemic drove uh, the speed of a lot of this thought over the last uh, 15, 15 or so months. And over the last year, uh, so we sell self-awareness and that, that's, there's different, um, <clears throat> different approaches and different characteristics and behaviours that we have and we describe them through the lens of, of, um, of colour. And over the last year, um, life or you know organization there might have been times where you needed to get in touch with what we call this fiery red energy part of yourself that's driven to achieve and you had to focus on taking action and getting stuff done <clears throat> try to keep it with stuff done rather than saying a, a different s word um or or the yellow which you may be able to embrace new realities each day um or as we all went through this um this life experience together that we've had this this part Last year, um, for many of our leaders and managers around the organisations that, that we work with, certainly. That and it's different one-on-one -on -one connection when you get when you're on a video screen with, with somebody in your team and you're looking straight into their eyes, you know, it's not. Bonding, structure and what's been a chaotic, chaotic period. And I know that um, the majority of Uh, every day we're having to right we need to take action and get stuff done or we need to generate ideas and, and um and so this is all the backdrop for how did we then innovate in our organization so you might actually like to reflect in this moment about what, what has your journey been for you within your organization and um and which of these uh, behaviors or characteristics have have developed a little bit more so that's just a little bit about what, what we do our journey to virtual was was uh, two twofold. One was internal to our own organisation, and the other one was external to uh, to our uh, clients. So I'll start with the internal one. Um, we uh, we had um, today, unfortunately, but prior to COVID, about forty percent of our workforce was remote, and then sixty percent were, were office based. So out of the six, 600 or so people in Dundee, there was 250 people. And I would say it was more like 99% of them are office based and 1% and were, were remote. So we use the technologies that were there. But as it ramped up in March uh, last year, we had to, we just made the decision, right, okay, we'll, we'll plan over two, two, three weeks. We'll transition everybody from office working to home working. <laughs> and then the next day, right, we need to do it in a week. And then this was the Monday, Tuesday, and on the Wednesday, it was like, 
do you know what? We need to do it by tomorrow because things are just getting a little bit too scary. And we actually flipped just over 60% of our workforce to, um, uh, to working remotely in, in one single day. And our head of enterprise technology, goodness knows how he, he sucked up that change, right? But it was like that, okay, I've got a few weeks to think about this. Let me start to do some planning. That was Monday's task. Tuesday was, can we do it by next week? And Wednesday, the, the question was, can you do it by tomorrow? And his answer was, I actually feel confident in the systems. We were lucky enough that we had 40% of the, of the workforce working remotely um, already, but that was a challenge and happy to share more, more about that. That um, a year, well, 15 months on, 15 or so months on, uh, now all of our employees are just working at home remotely. Our buildings and innovation, um, uh, innovation park and in, 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 um, uh, well, the technology park, sorry, in, uh, in Dundee are sitting in, empty. We have two buildings, Innovation House and Terra Nova, two big buildings, pretty, pretty much sitting empty, and they won't be open until at least the 1st of October. And we'll, we'll, we'll see if that, that happens. There are a, a handful of people who are, who are working in the buildings, like Martin is, is there. If, um, the technologies that we had are not the technologies that we have just now. And a lot of um, time in our IT platform services and infrastructure, we've, we've embraced the Microsoft of technologies. And we've tried some technologies and they have not worked and we've had to let them go. And um, one of the other things that we had to do as we were working from home is we have uh, offices around um, different geographies and we were integrating them onto our systems, you know, so onto the email systems, onto our CRM, uh, customer um, relationship management systems, um, <clears throat> and uh, onto our Microsoft Teams platform. And um, we were in process of, of that integration. And, um, and we continued that. And over the, over the last year, we've integrated another uh, 10%. So quite quite a challenge for enterprise tech guys. And they've done a great job in, in talking. And when I share some of the, the lessons that we've learned, I'll come back to that because the, the, the importance of community and the care that we have to have people technically connected as well as connected in conversation has been a huge, huge learn for us. Um, as I start to think about the, what, what we did for our customer, our, our customers, um, this quote came to mind from Plato, right? Necessity is the mother of invention. And you've probably experienced this in your own organisation. Holy schmoly, did we experience necessity being the mother of innovation. We are an events-based business, right? We provide learning events in a face-to-face -face environment. Occasionally, we've done like a webinar or something like that, you know, but like <laughs> revenue went through the floor in our organization literally overnight. From the middle of March, we started tracking it like our customers were just shutting down events because events were just getting closed in the world. And we had to flip our entire organization into virtual delivery, which we had minimal experience on. We were strategically building a digital um, customer platform, um, but that wasn't going to be ready overnight, right? So we had to be ready overnight. So I just love this, this thought. And if there's um, one thing I would like you to take away uh, from today is think about the necessity of what you need to change in your organization just now and use that uh, to, to invent things. And I'll share a little bit about what, what we did. Um, so some of this will make sense and be relevant to you. And some of it is more relevant to insights, but it's our story. So I'll share it anyway. So one of the things we do, the blue box on the left there, we, we provide a four day program, which is an accreditation qualification program for our clients around the world where they get accredited to work with these products within their own organization. So learning and development professionals become qualified in insights um, to simplify that for you over four days. And, um, and, and it's always been a face to face program for 25 years. It's been a face to face program. It's never been a virtual program. And uh, I was the I was a chap who uh, had the, the privilege to say um, on Friday the sixth of March last year, we're going to do this virtual. And then my my poor team, who loved me and hated me in the same moment, actually hated me and loved me in the same moment, is maybe the right way to put that around. Within twelve days, they rebuilt that program, and on the seventeenth of March, they started de delivering it. Now, if I track back to the twenty eighth of February. Um, I'd been away in, in, in Florida uh, with my family at, at Disney having fun, came back and just became aware of how the world was changing. If you remember back, everything was going crazy in Italy at the time, right? And, um, 
And on the 28th of February, myself with two of my team members had a, an exchange that was a Friday night at about 11 o'clock to say, look, something's happened. We need to move here. And so we decided that we we're going to make some recommendations to the executive team. And one of the things in that email, we said, this face-to-face -face four day qualification program must, we must retain the integrity. It must always be face-to-face. -face. And all three of us said, do you agree? And we all agreed <laughs> seven days later um, uh, on the sixth, it was like, right, change, change our minds. And we had to change the whole, the whole, uh, whole program. And I'm so glad we did that because the majority of our revenues came from that one program uh, for the year. And if we hadn't done that, we did lose about 100, 150 people, employees from our business, which had never happened in the 20 years I'd been at Insights. We'd, have, we'd hardly lost an employee. We'd always been growing. So we had a very tough year. But had we not done that flip and necessity being the mother of that invention, um, yeah, I, I, there would be a, another few hundred people around that wouldn't be working, working with Insights now. Um, in the red box, and you probably read some of the stuff on the slide, for, forgive me, um, that I'm, I'll be catching up with you here, but uh, we also had to build some virtual offerings for our, our, um, our clients. So our clients who get accredited to go and deliver within their organisation, they also couldn't run face-to-face -face events. And everything that we had was these tangible little block things, you know, that help you understand who you are. And, and, um, and uh, so we had, to, we had to repackage all the offerings that we put in their, in their hands. And we did that through, through March and April. And, um, and we also had to educate our practitioners to be able to use them. Now, a lot of them were getting, um, uh, were on the verge of being like furloughed and all that stuff in whatever country they were around the world. But in April, we had reached 400 clients um, to train them up on, on our new approaches. Now, to put that in context with the year before, the uh, Q1 in our financial year, the year before, uh, we were 693% up by the end of April. We are our webinar by, done that by the end of April. Um, it was a huge shift embracing whatever te technologies we had, our new technologies as Zoom was coming online and people stuff, we were using those for, for business purposes. Um, uh, we were using Which we, which we already um, top right one. There's languages in different regions of the world. So we had to run this, um, this uh, program that we flipped job in 12 days. We had to transform and get it out in, in multiple languages. We're now live in living language. 17th of March, two months and one week. Of, um, and there were in, in five different languages, which the people in different languages to deliver them, uh, marketing and uh, attracting them. <laughs> and just in time, translate. So um, all of this was brand new stuff for us. And um, <clears throat> the week that we were running our first qualification program on the 17th of March, a lady uh, called Tanya, and who was part of my team, delivering an accreditation out in San Francisco for. She was in their in their buildings on the Monday, and Wednesday, and on the on the Thursday. If you weren't an employee, you weren't hotel room two programs face to face in the moment for we're just throwing it throwing it at grand programs with all the delegates and all the um anyway the pandemic was as much the story as the as the so that's really um, the stories, some less that I will, of interest or, or, um, or value, value for you. Um, well, well, one thing that we did 17th of March is this is myself and our group CEO, Andy, Andy Lodian. And uh, we decided to just do some, some good in 
and just to just put out a free community we said we're going to watch about how what our perspective on the world and how we support you and um we put something out on tuesday thursday session in 48 hours 943 people sign up so um this was this was an example of us just trying something we had no idea if anybody was was interested or wanting to listen and uh, to get nearly a thousand people signed up in 48 hours was pretty special so we actually ran those um free community webinars for our customers every week for um, for four or five months some of you might have made it along to some of those i used to host them uh, from this very spot with my insights brand a t-shirt and all that stuff and and all, all my uh, and i tell you red bull got me through those because uh, i was working like 18 20 hour days as i'm sure many many of you were some of the other lessons and learnings that we, that we had along the way were um not so much about the technology right and um, but more about how you go about the technology and actually more of our learnings were not directly about the te technology but more about us so the importance of purpose so this is our um, organizational purpose which is blazoned on the doors of our terra nova building in the, in the tech park we want to create a world where people truly understand themselves and others and inspire to make a positive difference in everything that they do we kept coming back to this question as we tried new technologies as we for our internally for our own people and also for our for our customers and um and we were getting innovative with product ideas in the same way that uh, Mark, martin was talking uh, there and uh, we kept coming back to this is our reason why in the world so does this align with this or are we just trying to do something that doesn't align with why insights exist so i would say as you as you um, embrace digital and you embrace technology make sure you are clear about why your organization exists and it's it's finding ways to re reinforce that because it's so attractive to diversify and try something else and oh the technology does that so let's do this but if that's not the reason why your organization exists then you might spend a whole load of money and a whole load of time doing something that may or may not may, may or may not pay off so the importance of of the purpose and why you exist we we came back to this time and time again i chopped products that didn't um didn't align with our purpose and actually as we went through the process some products that we had from previous they they are in the process of going through the end of life cycle because the realization is they're not true to why the difference that our organization can make for our customers and um and in the world the second lesson is um small budgets are the engine of ingenuity so i tell you what this did not feel, this did not feel good at the time but i tell you it was really clear for us so what was a real problem and a real challenge of having no cash no money coming in um and no budget was you couldn't ask for a budget and um, so you had to be ingenious and we had to find a way to do what we do in the world with no budget and no money and um, so why why would why might i share that lesson the reason i would share that lesson with you is gosh investing in technology and digital innovations is like burning money or throwing money down the toilet it is amazing how much you can sp spend it's unbelievable how much you can spend and we we were doing that probably are still doing that as an organization but how we progressed in the in the first six months of the pandemic because we didn't have a budget and we didn't have cash flow was we just had to embrace all the technologies that were out there and partner with companies that knew how to do what they could do and for us we we are we are, our organization approach has been much more about um okay that's a cool technology how can we build that and do it in our way we had to just abandon that and just embrace embrace all all technologies so what was a huge problem um and and probably like gosh a lot of things kept me awake at night this was a huge one that kept me awake at night i said as i look back it was a massive opportunity and um and the number of ingenious thoughts and ideas and innovations that came out of the fact that we had no money to invest in it and um, it makes me think going forward we're just not going to throw money at technology and um, you have to put throw some money at it right and, and buy in capabilities and um speak to experts like alan and martin and 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 and, and purchase their services because they they know how to do they know how to do these things um but um but constrain your budgets and um and uh, make sure you balance the amount you invest with some some in ingenuity so i think we were uh lucky in a way that it happened 
obviously it's a pandemic was a hor horrible horrible thing and still is ongoing but organizationally the um some of the um some of the creative tension that that created in our organization is good and as going forward i advise you to uh not just have unlimited budgets on it but constrain it and look for the ingenuity and um, final final couple of lessons that we learned um so communicate 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 and i've highlighted the middle communicate because i think as leaders and managers um or actually more than that just as employees of our organization we always remember to communicate at the start and say oh we're starting this thing or i have this idea i'm going to communicate at the end you know when it's oh it's happening now but we always forget the middle communicate and for us as an organization we decided to just be really transparent with how we communicate and engage um our, our employees through our our digital transformation which was going hand in hand with a, a pandemic and then we we basically put our leadership on camera in front of the whole organization every week to just talk about whatever was going on and there were some really tough things that were happening um, in our, our organization and i would say um the transparency of of communication it was not a revelation for our organization because we were quite good at it but nowhere near where we are just now and as you're going <clears throat> as you look to innovate um through technologies and digital in your organizations i would say don't just say you're doing it and then talk about it when it's done keep 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 the story going for people so people know what what is happening is anything happening um and um, because everybody's hoping for the best but they're sort of expecting the worst type of thing and um so if you could keep communicating that middle communicate of here's the progress we're making and here's what we've run into and we're actually ditching this technology now and we tried that and it didn't work and um, so we're now moving to this one um, when people don't hear about that and they just see it happen it looks like you don't really know what you're doing so we find definitely that the transparency of communication allowed our people to feel engaged and then they can contribute and the last lesson that we we learned um i'm getting a message my, that my internet connection is unstable so hopefully you can still hear me um is around this slide here on the left community connections and care and the importance of community uh, so in our organization we had six 600 or so employees and here, here are some of them and um, uh, as you're transforming and changing as an organization bringing people into that and empowering uh, people within your organization to contribute and to um, think locally in their uh, teams for us it was different countries what, what, what their needs are and empower them to do that and, and pooling your community together instead of relying on specialists to do everything we had the specialists but we we um we enrolled our community and the spirit of our organization in the transformation that we were doing i would say as you as you do that the best thing is to um to pull on the fantastic people that are in your organization and give them opportunity to contribute and feel that they can own and uh, make a difference and make the change in their organization so hopefully some of that story has been useful hopefully you've been picked up by a, a nugget or two um uh, like the other guys very happy for you to connect with me on on linkedin and um and uh and uh, i think alison is going to lead us into q a so alison i'll stop sharing my screen and pass back to you brilliant thank you so much marcus um really interesting and i i mean i've got a, a few questions even as i was going and we've had a few questions in the chat so so yeah i mean i think um i guess you know just thinking about the the different presentations we had um and some of the, the some of the practical questions first maybe um so alan a couple of questions i think directed at you um and one um, very specific one about other cities in scotland so there's that aspect of you know well what happens next but i'm also interested so um, I am very fortunate now um, for the first time in our street to have a little um, thing at the end of my drive that will allow me to plug into the city fibre connections and the infrastructure that's there. So what happens next? How do I get um, this super, 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 super fast um, connection? Okay, thanks, Alison. So, yeah, so the, on the first query around um, locations and, and future expansion, so we are underway now with similar projects in um, Inverness, Aberdeen, um, Stirling, Edinburgh and Glasgow with you know, many, many more throughout the UK as well. Um, 
So, and then, you know, our, our focus um, is rolling out in those cities initially, um, but we will, and we already are starting to look at how we can then um, expand the footprint from there. Um, having that core network um, in a city enable, it will enable us in the future to, to build out from that. So, to be honest, I would have said um, a few years ago, so I, I joined City Fibre about three years back, um, and at that time, I mean, the company's called City Fibre, which suggests that we, we would only be interested in doing cities. And at that point, that was very much the, the strategy of the, of the business. Um, but I would say over the last six, 12 months, that has been, that has been evolving, and we're certainly looking at how we can how we can go beyond and how we can how we can reach. Now, within cities, um, the, the the private investment kind of stacks up. It, it makes sense and it's it's um, it works for us to to do that at our own cost. Whereas when you go into rural, um, there is a requirement for um, for government funding, and that is you know that, that is uh, something that is, that is in place. There's Scottish uh, government funding and UK government funding that is available to to some uh, locations. So um, operators like ourselves um, can uh, bid essentially for, for bundles, so rural bundles, and that would mean that there's a uh, contribution towards the, the cost of, of rolling out some of these locations. Um, uh, alongside that, there's, there's also the, the, the voucher. Oh. Now we've lost Alan. You know what we should do is we should entice them to move to our part of the world. <laughs> You're back. <laughs> Great idea. <laughs> um, so yeah, so ho hopefully that answers the, the, the first part of the question. Um, and with regards to actually getting connected, so um, we we essentially um, pass properties at this stage as we're rolling out the network on a street by street basis. We leave, as you mentioned, outside of each home or outside of each business, we leave what we call a Toby box. So it's a small, small cap um, on the on the pavement just at the boundary to the property. So the cable is left within there. And then as and when somebody wishes to connect, um, an engineer would go out and take it from the from the pavement uh, to, to their property. You know, they would discuss with the, with the, the, the resident how best to, to get there. Uh, and then they'll connect it into the router within within the property. So um, City Fibre, I'm not sure I mentioned this, we own, manage and operate the, the physical network itself. We don't sell anything to, to any end users. So we work with um, service providers and service providers, um, whether that's you know, for, for businesses or for, for residents. So uh, like so Vodafone and, and TopTalk and Zen and, and uh, an increasing number of others will we'll utilise our network to, to offer services to, to residents and, and businesses. So, um, so yeah, you would you would place an order through the one of the providers, uh, and then that's how you how you get connected essentially. But as I say, we have the the postcode checkers. We really popular on on the website. A lot of people. It's often the first question that they get asked when you come to my street or how, how can I connect. So, um, you can stick your postcode into that. Um, it might not be able to tell you time scales if you're if you're not connected yet, but it'll it'll let you know if you can connect, um, and it will also um, give you the opportunity to register so that you can you can be contacted and updated when there's any news on, on services becoming available. Great, thank you. Um, and then I think we there was there's been a bit of a chat in the chat about rural connectivity because because you're right, um, Alan, when you're talking about the cities. And I think you know a city like Dundee saw this in the past, where you know in the dim and distant past, where you know the cable networks came in and it just obviously was not viable to go into every street and and also it wasn't viable for for some of the business premises. So even where the chamber offices are down at City Key is. Um, it's not um, well connected in terms of the, the fibre connection. And this is where you get then some innovative solutions come around. And um, at the moment, our internet down there is, is coming through the radio waves. So, and I know that some of that kind of solution is exactly what's been employed within the rural um, services that Angus and, and Perth and and Ross are, are actually putting together. So I put a note in the chat, but as part of the work that I do on the Tay Cities Joint Committee, last Friday we approved a really quite significant investment in to the digital investments that are going to happen within Angus and, and Perthshire. And, and I know more about, unfortunately, I know more about the Angus one than I do about the Perth one, but they, I would encourage... Um, so there's been a, a couple of offers to connect people with those in the councils that know more about this than me. Um, in Angus, they're doing some really 
interest in and innovative stuff again with um using sort of um the council property so they're going to actually the councils will put fiber to the council properties and then we'll use a council property in an area to be a wi-fi beacon i think in that right and um, so essentially you know in some of the really small areas the the school or the community center or the hub or the council premises will actually be the place that um we will get our or or those communities will get their wi-fi signals from and businesses too so business parks are being enabled so that then the businesses within that business park can then get some access to some really fast fiber connections and then in the much more rural areas, um, there are there are some um, Internet of Things projects going on where farmers will put a, a little receiver onto their barn and then will use technologies to track their cattle, their you know the the um, the way that the um, the weather is going to affect their crops. It's just going to be there are some super interesting projects, and so I've put a wee link into the chat, um, and we will definitely connect those of you that are interested in in finding out more, whether it's from Perth and Kinross Council or whether it's from Angus. Um, but hopefully that that covers off a bit about that because the the R100 project that is is kind of getting to the end of its. Um, life within the governments is still not do nearly enough it's still quite an expensive solution um, and i think that's where um service providers like alan's talked about will come together possibly and and help businesses all bid in for their r100 funding to collectively come up with a solution that might just fit what businesses need and um, so so yeah lots going on and um, so some of my other questions then um martin i, I guess a question for you would be in, in the last few months, the Scottish Government put out £10 million like that for digital innovation. And I know that um, lots of SMEs weren't ready for that. Um, lots of SMEs were ready for it or had, a, had an off-the-shelf project and went and got um, you know, an upgrade to their website or invested in something. But for me, I think the, the issue I have with that is that it didn't give us time to do the thinking to be truly innovative so that the funding that the Scottish Government are spending really helps us all move properly from A to D rather than, you know, just kind of small increments that don't help us innovate or help us have that strategic thought process. So I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that and how businesses could actually start to get themselves ahead of the game, because that will it is unlikely, I'm sure, to be the last kind of funding that is put out there for digital innovation. Yeah, my thoughts are not great. Um, we, um, I, I think if we're allowing government to drive innovation, then we're in a bad place. I think it has to be industry and people that drive it. We were working with a company in Edinburgh just now, uh, building a, a new travel platform, um, and they've taken it upon themselves to do this. And they're, they're, it's, it's a great deal for us because they're, they're paying us to build the platform, and then we're doing a revenue share to take it to market with us. But it's going to be industry that, that drives this, not not that the hand up mentality. That I know it's been a strange eighteen months, but industry needs to drive this. You know, and it's got to be done for the right reason. For the, the at the end of the the tunnel, there is revenue generation happening. Mm -hmm. um, we get involved so heavily in in projects, um, and we've worked a lot of government projects both here and right now. We're working with Bupa and Spelthorne Council, the council that surrounds Heathrow, um, and it's such a heavily funded project. In the end of it, there's no there's no outcome. We did um, about 15 years ago. We worked on a project called My Entitlement to Learning, and it was. A project that was um, God. I'm going to be so down on the on the government here. I'm not not meaning to be this way, but um, it was there was um, Scottish Enterprise, Scottish Government, um, Scottish Volunteer. There were seven universities involved, six colleges, and um, they, they they had this project. They farmed it out to a French company. It failed. We came in. We built it in about four months after it failed for eighteen months, and then we delivered it after the four month process. And they went to us. We don't know what to do with this. We don't have uh, a contingency plan to, to, to do this, to launch it. It was a project for creating something for the sake of creating it. So, and I, I think that happens a lot with these, these, these projects where money's handed out and it's just a case of, well, we'll see what we get from it. And it's a, it's a math. I'm not trying to be overly negative. I just think there needs to be a commercial end to it. We're all commercial people and, you know, we come from commercial backgrounds and I think 
do something because it, it creates wealth, not because it, it creates a project. So it was quite negative, but it's my birthday again, so we can do that. <laughs> no, and no, and I, I absolutely don't disagree with you because we've challenged government um, on that return on investment. You know, like we don't want. You're absolutely right. We don't necessarily want government to um, set the agenda, or um, then uh, you know it becomes a bit of a pat on the back, but actually has it really achieved what we needed to achieve? So I guess so. If I'm sitting here in the audience and I'm going. Right, I'm sure that there is scope for digital innovation in my business. Where do I start, Martin? Um, well, it's an analysis process. You have to work out there is a need to do something. It's don't don't do it for the sake of doing it, and that's why when uh, we I'll actually I'll, I'll share a document as well, just an example of the the process that we go through, and that is that you break it down uh, the entire business down into the constituent parts and works out what you need. Don't just do something for the sake of doing it. And that's, I mean, it's a horrible, these documents we create are horrible documents. There are hundreds of pages of wireframes and process driven stuff, but uh, you have to do it. It's basically, it's a blueprint for the company. So it's like building a house. It's the same thing, you know, working out properly at the start of it. Uh, and we go there. I mean, we work with, I know Julie's on the, on, on the, the call we're having just now. And, you know, we, we've worked with Julie for over 20 years now um, through, uh, through Taste Screen and Dundee City Council and Create Converge. And it's always been done properly. It's always been spec'd out properly. There's always been a need and a requirement to do it. Um, if you do stuff on a whim, it's going to end badly. And, and it ends up being a bun fight between you and your client. So the, the, the spec process protects both sides. Um, and it's just the, the realistic way to do it. So it's the commercial way to do something. Perfect. Marcus. Uh, yeah, I had some thoughts on this. There's two. Um, uh, so there are there are primarily three disciplines of, of any organisation. One is around customer intimacy. One is around operational effectiveness or operational excellence, sorry. And one is around product innovation. And um, Insights have, have always been a, a very product innovative organisation. And so we can use we can use technologies and digital to enhance that. Um, but one of our pain points is our operational excellence, you know, like, uh, oh gosh, I was waiting to say Amazon, so bad, bad timing to use Amazon as an example, right, with all that stuff on the news, but like, um, but obviously their operational excellence or Alibaba in the, in, in the Far East do the, do the same thing, you know, and, um, uh, or customer intimacy, right, organizations that really know their customer in, inside out. So you might like to think, building on Martin's thought, you might like to think about, so what, why would you be wanting to embrace digital and technologies in a really purposeful way through architecture? That might be one framework to think about. I know that we are um, we are building platforms to create communities for our customers um, uh, to come on and to to um, to embrace our product and experience our product. But we're going to be observing their their behaviours, and so um, so it's going to help us become much more intimate with our customers. By which I just mean we're going to understand them better. So any innovations we do from a product perspective will be driven by that intimacy, or any operational pain points that they have with us will be driven by us understanding them them a lot more. So our drive is really to become use the technology to help us to become more innovative. Um, and uh, and there's I think there was a comment from from Michelle about what are we doing to to future proof our organisation for the next five years. It's thinking about those three areas and knowing what, what dance what dance we're doing. So um, we have um, by reaching out and doing some of the free uh, complimentary sessions that myself and my Gandhi and the junior did. We we um, extended our our community and customer reach. And we started to understand our customers better, which helps us drive the innovation and know which products to uh, end their life cycle and uh, where our customer needs were, so that we could we could drive more. Now whether I. I different flavors of organization on here but but think about do we do I want to use technology to, to understand our customers better so we can be a better organization or to create more operational efficiency and excellence is that an area or is it to innovate our products and, and ex extend those could be all of those things or it could be one of those things as your major driver to get started so um, that, that would be my thought I agree 100 percent uh, Marcus I think I think as a company we we arrive at because uh, we're, we're basically we're a data management company. You know, we, we build systems that, that collect data, that manipulate data, and then disseminate the data. We are pretty much agnostic of what you do. 
So we arrive um, at a project without any you know, um, precognitions about, about what they should be doing. The client has to tell us what they want to innovate. So we don't come with any ideas. And I think that's different when we're creating our own products, you know, then we get all kind of weird about stuff. Then we think we know what we're doing, we probably don't. But, uh, but we, we, are, we are creating something on, uh, under the guidance of the innovation that somebody, and because it's an inventive step, um, people come to us where whenever a client arrives with us, the, the first thing that we do is we, we do assignation of IP. The ideas aren't ours, you know, and I think that that's trying to sum up where the innovation comes from. It isn't us. We give you the IP of the thing that we're building on your behalf because you're the smart guy. You're the one that came with the idea, not us. So uh, I agree 100% with you said, Mark. Um, Martin, I wonder if I could throw that same question at you. How, how are you future-proofing for the next five to 10 years? Well, we, we evolve all the time because we're changing new technologies. I mean, we, we did a pivot um, of technologies about six or seven years ago. We used to develop in a, a language called Cold Fusion that we changed over to Microsoft because it was easier to hire people. Um, that was the core of that. But the, the future-proofing our stuff right now, it's cyber. And it's, um, you know, we are... Um, you know, if a company isn't looking at cybersecurity, and we're not specialists in cybersecurity at all. You know, what we have is global partners that are coming on Friday. You know, if anyone wants to come to St. Andrews for canapes and wine, crack on on, on Friday, please come and join us. Um, you know, we've got global partners that, I mean, one of the partners is effectively the security arm of the American government that, that developed a technology called Stealth that they used in one of the Gulf Wars. So what we're looking at is how, how bad software is and realizing, you know what, that needs to be plugged as a hole and a gap. Uh, we all talk about cyber. The people that actually, um, that are really interested in cyber are the people that usually have just been ransomware. So, um, I'm just sorry. Um, so we're looking at, um, for future proofing, we're looking at what our clients need. It's kind of not what we want, it's what they need. Uh, and right now it's cyber and it'll change and it'll evolve going forward. Eventually we'll get cyber, Thing looked after, uh, but it'll be external part. It, it was when I was I spent time with um, one of our partner company called Imperium, but it, it came from Unisys, and it was you think your mobile phone. So I thought my mobile phone was secure. It really isn't, and this is how we connect to our networks now. And it's the it, it's the way people get into it. It's your TVs and that kind of stuff. So working with Imperium, well, we're now we're now trying to plug these holes. Um, We've got the guys, and we've got Chris Nat from Oracle coming over on Friday as well. And it's the one to sit down with uh, the guys in Imperium and find out how, again, inherently at the core of it, we can do that. The um, the meeting we've got, uh, a guy called uh, Nitin Metu. Nitin owns, um, he owns Color Tokens. He also owns Deliveroo, Green Oak Capital, Viking Cruises. He's joining us on Friday as well, just to say that they're pumping so much money into this industry because... Um, it's the next step. It's, it's looking after our stuff and that's what we're doing. So uh, I think the, the next stage for us for future proofing is cyber um, and then we'll, we'll see what comes up for the next bit. Because we don't know. Brilliant, thank you. Um, uh, does anybody have any question that they want to come in and ask themselves? If you do, um, please just put your hand up if you can use the virtual hand or drop something, something into the chat. Um, as, as we've all been speaking, I, I've been kind of taking notes about, you know, we, we've talked about the future of work. And I think we all know we're probably not going to go back to the office as of 16 months ago, but nobody really kind of knows what it's going to look like. And I think one of the biggest issues, or it feels like um, one of the biggest issues is going to be around that collaboration and idea generation when we just all can't be in the same space. But we have got technology there and perhaps that's a, a solution. So... I'm just interested in, in um, you know, from each of our speakers and in, in how you're currently kind of doing that and how you think that that might adapt in your business going forward. Um, Marcus, do you want to maybe go first? Uh, yeah, sure. So we, um, uh, so if I, if I localised it to Dundee part of our organisation, um, uh, we had like three three buildings. Um, Terranova, our main home base, we were leasing another building, Innovation House, which is kind of beside the Bright Solid, if you know where that is. And then we had um, we had leased another part of our building for enter Enterprise Tech. We're, we're pulling back to, to a couple of buildings. Um, the One of the buildings, we're just going to hot desk people in, so we aren't going to give people uh, locations are, and at home. The default position will be three days in office, two days at home. 
but some people might go two and three, some people might go zero, uh, zero and five, right? But there'll, there'll not be any four in office or five days in, in office. The other building we're, um, we're going to share with our sister organisation, which is through in Stirling, Tech. So they'll come and take the top floor and the bottom floor will just be a creation a project space. And, um, and even in uh, the Terra Nova building, there'll be lots of hot desks, but lo lots of space for coming in to do you know, uh, short um, short collaboration um, uh, conversations and try and mix it with as many disciplines as as possible. And and um, Aberté a number of years ago, right, came up with the white the whole white space um, initiative. Gosh, what was that like? Eight, ten years ago? Goodness knows, time flies. But um, uh, there's brilliance in that and getting multi disciplines um, floating around project spaces. And so um, so that that's how we intend to do it going forward. How we're doing it just now is. Um, it's amazing. It's amazing some of the technologies out there. So we're using just implemented um, uh, a technology called Miro, a platform called Miro. Well, you just you, just, you may be familiar with it, right? You just and it's like you've got real post-it notes, and everybody's on with their color post-it notes on the Miro board, and you can zoom in and you can zoom out. And as long as you get the facilitation right, um, and we're, we're we're lucky and blessed actually to have quite a number of facilitators because it's our line of work. But um, um, and uh, you, 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 there is something different about collaborating on an online space that creates a level playing field for, for people, whereas in the room sometimes people, gosh, like myself, might dominate and be a bit too vocal and others might be um, in, in, in the background. There's something about collaborating in the online space where ev if you get everybody on camera and you do things like check-ins and go around, what do you think, what do you think? And when you've got these mural platforms where people are just posting their ideas and you don't really know unless you assign colours to post-it notes, you just get in this mix of um, ideas and ingenuity that I talked uh, about earlier, earlier on. So it's, it is amazing. The, the technology platforms that are free and out there that you can access and use now are, are really cool. So that's one, one thought, Alison. Um, back to you. Yeah, I think, uh, can I just kind of jump in again? Um, we, I, again, Marcus, I, I agree that uh, it's changed the way that they're collaborating, but we're actually getting bigger space now as well. So um, when well, when it started and the developers, um, you know, all of them, they, they, I think they all enjoyed the thought they're going to be working from home. Very quickly, they found out they didn't like it and they, they missed the, you know, the, the interaction with everybody. So we ended up having a hybrid model in the building. And now the point now, we again, we're, we're back running out of space. So in a couple of weeks, um, we're signing, a, actually we've got a new office coming up. So we're taking over Brockley County train station. It's going to be our new office, which is kind of cool. Um, and we've got two of our partners that are coming in and, uh, and joining us in that space as well. So um, I, I, I think it's changed. I don't think it's changed forever. I think we are going to be trying to get in a room together as best we can. Because um, it's just, it's, it's having such a bad effect on people. You know, the, the lack of lack of interaction, it just doesn't work. You know, um, I think we realize how, how, how well, and I, I, it has changed without question, you know, and it will be a hybrid model for us as well, which it is just now. It'll be two or three days a week. You know, people saying they've got to tell us in advance of when they're coming in and when they're not coming in. But um, I think we're all looking forward to getting back to it. And um, and I, I think, you know, forming a base, so we know that uh, Wipro and the Color Tokens are both going to come in with us in the new building. So. Uh, yeah, we're looking forward to all getting back together again. And actually, um, is it for Friday, Alison, we'll send you a link for the Teams thing. If you can share it with everybody, that's okay. And you're more than welcome to join us on, on Friday. You'll watch us all getting drunk, but that's fair enough. Is it is it a coincidence that it's in your birthday week, Martin? <laughs> it just happened that way. It's been fortunate. <laughs> um, Alan, what's your thoughts on the whole collaboration and the future? Yeah, I mean, in terms of the, the workplace itself, um, similar to what Martin was saying there, I, to be honest, I think we're going to need more space because obviously if you go into the office at the moment, we've got a booking system for desks and some of the desks have just been, you know, blocked out as, as you would expect. So um, and people are desperate to get back in, you know, uh, just as an example, we've got a couple of members of the team who, who live at home on their own and, you know, they in particular, I just, just can't wait to get back in and, and collaborate, you know, face to face. And um, but as Marcus says, you know, we, we're utilising more technologies. There, there's some fantastic, you know, technology available. Uh, some, a lot of it free as well. Um, I think um, important though when you're rolling out new technologies within the business, um, 
it's to ensure that people are trained and people are excited about it. They, they're totally on board with utilising it and they can see the benefits that it's going to bring to them. But just making sure that they've got the, the, the relevant training as well and the ongoing support, because otherwise, um, you know, I think we can, we can sort of lose interest in the uh, doesn't quite deliver the, the value that we, we hope that it might. So I think um, that was a, just one of the thoughts I was going to share. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. Well, I think we're running out of time. Um, so a huge thank you to everybody that took the time to come in and, um, and participate and listen in on the session today. Um, massive thank you to Martin and to Marcus and to Alan um, and City Fibre for helping put this on today. It was really interesting. I knew it would be a, um, a fab discussion and I'm away with so many notes and, and different things to kind of think of which is always what happens when we get people from businesses together to just kind of um, shoot the breeze and, and talk about something that they're passionate about. So thank you so much um, for, for joining us. Massive thank you to Sarah um, and the team at the Chamber for, for putting this on today. Um, and I hope you have a really good Tuesday and let's hope we're, we're all um, boogieing tonight and we're celebrating with the rest of them. So um, thanks again, folks, and I look forward to catching you at another event. Thank you. Cheers. Bye.